Welcome to this edition of Like Nobody's Business. I'm Mary Beth Sewald, President and CEO of the Las Vegas Metro Chamber of Commerce. We are here today with the President and CEO of the Las Vegas Convention and Visitors Authority, Mr. Steve Hill. Steve, thanks for joining us. Thanks, Mary Beth. Glad to be here. Arguably, you are a leader who is responsible for one of the most exciting projects in our region, the expansion of the Convention Center. Talk to us a little bit about that, why that's so exciting, and what does it really mean for our area? Well, uh, as you can see now, we are uh, expanding the Convention Center by uh, 600,000 square feet of exhibition space and about 150,000 square feet of meeting space. Um, and this is just responding to Las Vegas being a great place to have meetings. Uh, our customers came to us through the Tourism Infrastructure Committee uh, three or four years ago and said, you need to get bigger because our shows are getting bigger, people want to come to Las Vegas. Um, and we worked through that process, went to the legislature, the governor and the legislature approved that, uh, and now we're really moving forward. So we're really excited about that. We're really excited about all the meeting space uh, in Las Vegas that we're adding. Um, we're adding three million square feet of meeting space in Las Vegas, which to put that in perspective, there are only five cities in the United States that have three million square feet of meeting space. Um, so we'll end up with 14 and a half million uh, once we're done with the, this round of uh, construction that's going on uh, throughout the city. So this expansion really will put Las Vegas back, back on the map again in terms of the size of our convention space, meeting space, and so forth. Well, and you know, we're certainly on the map primarily because we're in Las right. Vegas. Um, but it does elevate the experience. Uh, one of our focuses, one of your focuses, is uh, taking care of our customers, whether that's show organizers or exhibitors or all of the attendees that visit those events. And the experience at the convention center itself, um, we think needs to be elevated to match the experience that they expect when they come to Las Vegas. And this really allows us to do that uh, as, as well as expand. And the expansion should allow us or enable us to bring even more conventions to Southern Nevada. It should. It's, it's not just to allow the shows that we have to get bigger and grow into what they have become. Um, it gives us an opportunity really to be additive um, and uh, attract um, really new shows that have had an interest but really haven't had um, a, a slot that they can fit into at the convention center. Uh, so we're excited about that as well. Another really exciting project that we have going on at the LBCVA is the People Mover with the Boring Company, partnership with Elon Musk's company, the Boring Company. Tell us a little about that. Well, um, I think a lot of people have probably heard about the Boring Company, but they'll get to see it here in a year and a half or so. Uh, it'll be two underground tunnels, uh, that, uh, in one going in each direction, uh, that connect three stations that allow people to move you know, really seamlessly throughout what has become a very large uh, convention center campus. Um, we're excited about that um, and what it brings to Las Vegas, but um, there's also the potential that we could move this into the city, down the strip, into the airport, out into the community. And if that, that real upside happens, uh, that'll be a real difference maker in terms of transportation and congestion uh, in the entire area. And it's one of the reasons that we really think it makes sense to move forward with this at the convention center as well. A lot of chamber members are asking me specifically, is this something, like you say, that will expand throughout the rest of the city? Is it safe? How fast is it? Give us a little bit of insight on what it would be like to use the people mover. Well, uh, to answer the question of whether it will move into the city, um, we do have an agreement with the boring company to do that, but we want to make sure that it's safe, that it works, that it does have the capacity that theoretically it should have uh, before we make that whole citywide move. Um, it's, a, it's a very affordable system because they'll, they would pay for the infrastructure and then charge a fare that would be somewhere between what a bus and an Uber or Lyft would cost. Uh, so it'll be an affordable system um, both to put in as well as uh, for uh, the citizens of the region. Um, it will take some time. We want to get it up and running at the convention center, um, but um, it, it is planned to move into the destination, um, and it would do so pretty quickly. This is a system that is um, relatively straightforward to install, so it wouldn't take 10 years to make this happen. It would be you know, three, four, five. 
And I know a lot of people are excited about how fast it'll be, how clean it is. There are three stops, yep. uh, and it's a loop as well. Yeah, it, it's um, they're all electric vehicles, so there'll be Model Xs and Model 3s, and then we're uh, working with the boring company to design a 16-person tram. Um, you can, you know, you can move as fast as those cars will go, but we're not going to accelerate at a rate that will scare our, our attendees. Um, so at the convention center, so top it's not going to be like be one of the rides at the at the properties. Not a. <laughs> you can make it that yeah. way, and I've been in the uh, the tunnel in Hawthorne where, uh, in a mile and a quarter, we got to a top speed of 110 miles an hour. Now, we're not gonna do that here. Uh, top speed of the convention center would be about 35 miles an hour and probably in the destination be about 60 or 65. Okay, this is really exciting uh, uh, innovation and, and it's, it's constantly evolving as well. What do you think is, uh, that what, what is it that gives you the most confidence that this is the best mode of transportation for Las Vegas? Well, um, you know, when you look at what it takes in order to have an effective transportation system here, it needs to be affordable. It needs to be able to be put someplace where it fits. And frankly, underground is really one of the, really the, about the only option for that. Um, and it has, you know, theoretically very high capacity. Uh, so maybe 12 to 18,000 people per hour uh, could be in this system just on the strip and to the airport. Uh, as you move into the communities, then obviously that capacity increases. Um, so th that combination of um, factors make it really the only system that meet, checks all of those boxes. Now we need to show that it works. Mm -hmm. We need to prove uh, the system. Um, but as long as that happens, and we feel pretty confident that it will, um, then it becomes an attractive part of a transportation solution. It's not intended uh, to replace other options, um, but it is a difference maker uh, if this can work. It's a game changer. It really would be. Absolutely. What are some other uh, innovations? I know you've been really busy at the LVCVA. What are some other innovations that um, you're incorporating into the convention center uh, and the expansion that will keep Las Vegas on the top of that convention list? Well, you know, when you when you build something new, you have the opportunity to um, roll in cutting edge technology. Um, and there's a baseline of you know connectivity that people expect uh, when they go to any place anymore, really. And we'll we'll certainly have that. Um, but we're looking at uh, ways to incorporate autonomy, uh, different forms of uh, marketing and advertising. So we're looking at projection. We're looking at um, portable marketing and advertising uh, in in the uh, new facility. Um, we're looking at different ways to um, incorporate food and beverage. Uh, we want to be more nimble. Uh, we want to be responsive to different shows and what the audiences are going to be at each of those shows. So those are just some of the ways that we're, you know, it's kind of a blank slate. We have the opportunity uh, to uh, incorporate everything that's new, and we're um, choosing what makes the most sense along those lines. Well, you're certainly doing a lot of great things at the LVCVA, and the, all of us at the Las Vegas Chamber of Commerce appreciate your service, and it's a great time to be doing business in Southern Nevada. Well, we appreciate the partnership with the Chamber, and likewise, you, do, you guys are doing great things. So well, thank thanks you, for Steve. Having we appreciate me. it. Steve Hill, President and CEO of the Las Vegas Convention and Visitors Authority. Stay with us. We'll be right back right after this. Life's journey isn't just about what happens. At Nevada State Bank, we believe it's about who it happens with the people who are there for I do and for welcome home, the people who are there for your growing business and the ones who are there for a lifetime. For every moment of life's journey, the people of Nevada State Bank are here for you because it matters who you spend life's moments with and it matters who you bank with. Nevada State Bank. This is the story of two businesses. Andy made a lemonade stand and hoped people would come. Jill did too, but she chose a team to get the word out about her lemonade stand. Jill learned early that advertising with the right team gets the best results.
At Cox Media, we do this every day, helping your business grow to meet its potential. With our marketing expertise, Cox Media is your partner for advertising success. Don't let your business get left behind. Let's grow your business together. Contact Cox Media today. My name is Shane Jasmine Young. I'm the founder and member of Young Law Group. The chamber has a great sense of community and fellowship, and that's what I enjoy. It's not intimidating. People want to help each other. They make introductions. They want to connect people, even if it's not necessarily going to benefit them directly. But it's all about connection and feeling that sense of community and togetherness is really what I like. Remember Old Vegas where the customer was king? The Casablanca and Mesquite is just like Vegas used to be. Play over 40 of your favorite table games. Play over 800 slot and video poker machines and get comps, free play, and cash back. Get away and play two 18-hole championship golf courses. Or pamper yourself in our full-service salon and unwind in our world-class spa. Now this is my kind of getaway. Reserve your $99 golf or spa getaway today. It's just like Vegas used to be. Welcome back to this edition of Like Nobody's Business. One of the most important bills that passed the 2019 legislative this year was SB 543, which updated K through 12, the funding formula. Our next guests are State Superintendent of Education, Joan Ebert, along with Economic Analyst, Jeremy Aguero with Applied Analysis. Thank you for joining us today. Thanks for having us. Thank you for having we us. We appreciate it. Jeremy, I consider you kind of the, the one of the architects of SB 543, along with Senator Woodhouse and, and Mo Dennis. Can you tell us a little about how SB 543 changes the funding landscape for, Clark, for the Clark County School District? Well, I think it changes it overall for the state of Nevada, right? I mean, we've been operating under this thing that people have heard about called the Nevada Plan. Um, and, and it's come under a fair amount of criticism. I think some of it was justified. Some of it probably wasn't justified. We have real challenges in the state of Nevada, the funding formula only being one of them. But what SB 543 does, I think, is really kind of five things, if you will. Number one, it increases transparency with regard to education. It makes sure that it's clear to everybody how much money is coming in to education and where those dollars are ultimately going. We had the ability to figure that out over time, but it was very difficult for people to understand. Right? Number two, it creates a savings account for education, where historically money had gone to schools and then some of that money would revert back to the state's general fund and could be used for some other purposes other than education. Those dollars will now be held with education. The third element is it replaced that old Nevada plan 52 years ago. It was created with something called the pupil-centered funding formula, which means that every dollar has to follow every student in the state of Nevada, whether that's general dollars that go to every student or whether that's dollars that are specifically designed for students that are maybe uh, in special education programs or gifted and talented student programs or maybe they're living at or near the poverty level or English language learners there are special dedication of funds that have the ability to go the direction it makes it very clear how those dollars flow through now for a district like Clark County of course an urban district which has a relatively high number of students that are for example living at or near the poverty level we think about that in terms of kids that qualify for free and reduced lunch this is going to create some some additional revenue flowing in that direction. But that matters a lot less than the fact that every student everywhere in the state, whether they're in Eureka County or in Esmeralda County or Washoe County or Clark County, the formula works the same way to make sure that the dollars follow the students. The two other elements of it are, number one, the creation of a commission to help this woman next to me, who we are so blessed to have in our state to be uh, guiding us through what is a very difficult time, um, uh, and, and to provide some guidance and information and technical assistance as um, uh, her group, the Nevada Department of Education, works through all the nuances of this formula. And then finally, uh, the last element is an increase in accountability. Um, also a uh, responsibility of the Nevada Department of Education, but I think uh, before it didn't exist at the level it will on a go forward basis in terms of transparency in reporting to make sure that every dollar follows every student. And uh, Superintendent Ebert, um, Jeremy has done an excellent job of laying out the five benefits and the features of, of the plan. Can you tell us how the Nevada Department of Education will be implementing the plan? So we'll be working with the commission. Um, we're very excited. It's 11 members that have great expertise in finance, and those um, folks will be identified by the legislature and the governor. Um, the CFOs across the state, there are four CFOs that will be joining the team as well. 
Um, one of the first things that they'll be tackling, first things, it's, it's a, I guess, if I back up just for a moment, um, we've been talking about this for decades. And so to have this moment in time right now where we're actually moving forward and changing the formula is huge. It's huge for Clark County, it's huge for the entire state of Nevada and um, something that we're all looking forward to. Working with the commission will be critical um, as we look at components such as um, small schools. Some people forget that there are small schools within Clark County. They think about um, Las Vegas itself, but the county also has small schools. Looking also at small school districts and then cost of living. The differentiation across our state when you look at um, the cost of living varies. And so the commission will be spending quite a bit of time looking at that as well. Okay, and I know one of the questions that I've heard even from our members is, um, I guess we won't be switching immediately from the Nevada plan to the new plan. Will the plans run parallel for a couple of years, Jeremy? Sure, and the answer to that question is yes. Um, one of the conversations we had a few times was that, that there is a, would be a big risk in trying to flip the switch overnight, right? I mean, this is complicated stuff. And so the, the, what the legislature ultimately came up with, um, I think is the right move. And that is to run both the Nevada plan and the pupil-centered funding formula concurrent for a two-year period. Now, um, the new formula becomes effective for the school years that is the 2021-2022 school year. But as the superintendent indicated, there's some, there's some calculations, there's some assumptions that need to go into that. We want to make sure all of those are right. So this really provides the opportunity to make sure that school districts can be prepared, make sure that all the loose ends are tied up, the, particularly the calculation loose ends, and to make sure that everything is functioning exactly how it was intended. So the bill itself becomes effective immediately because this commission has to be created. Obviously, the department has a lot of work to do in the interim, but the new formula will actually become effective about two years from now when all that other work is completed. So it's really kind of a safety net. I don't think there's any doubt about that whatsoever. Mm -hmm. It's exactly what it's designed to do. Which puts a lot of uh, parents' minds at ease and things like that because, you know, when you have a completely revamped funding formula, that could create some nerves. And so people are saying, okay, we just want to make sure that this is going to go smoothly. So I think that's the perfect solution. Right. It's one thing to say, trust me. It's another thing to be able to be transparent about the information and the data. And I think when people start seeing the transparency and how the money flows, they'll feel more comfortable about adding additional funds to education. Okay. And, and I know that in terms of policy, you've talked a little about the next steps, working with the commission and so forth. Can you tell us a little bit more about what the school district will do to uh, improve student educational outcomes? So I... I can't speak for the superintendent right. as far as um, the school district itself. Uh -huh. um, we were very fortunate already this legislative session that there were millions of dollars added to, for instance, the Read by Grade 3 program. Um, so focusing on those components as well as um, social workers, school counselors, school safety, those pieces. So we're running the current formula, as Jeremy had indicated. We have the new formula coming up. And as, and, and we have looked at, quite frankly, as a community, the differentiation of needs. And so making sure that we have equal opportunities for all of our students, um, making sure that they all can get across the finish line and we have the same bar and expectations for all students um, is very important. And I know we've already talked a little, Jeremy touched on this, on, on the funding formula and the reallocation re of the existing funds. It was characterized the other day by Puna Mather uh, that it was really like, a, a change in the plumbing. It wasn't, it wasn't going to generate extra money. You kind of touched on that. Can you kind of clarify a little bit more about how the money works and, that, and what kind of new funds might be included? Yeah, sure. Look, I think what's, what's really important at the outset is exactly what the superintendent just said, and that is legislators put a lot of new money into K-12 through education um, this go around. And, and but the, the, the challenge is the transparency, to be able to see where it's going and make sure it's going exactly where it's intended. That's the plumbing uh, that Poonam likes to talk about. And, and I, I think with that, um, when we think about those allocation of funds, I, I, again, I think what the superintendent said is exactly right. If we didn't fix the formula, if we don't have that level of transparency and that belief in the leadership, then it's gonna be really difficult to have a conversation about putting additional money in to that formula. Now, what we did is we've created a framework uh, the, in, which will work in that direction. 
allowing us to have a long overdue but very important conversation about are we funding our schools adequately right I, I think what was just mentioned in terms of equity and making sure that every student has the opportunity to succeed is what's critically important and she's probably being a little bit um, you know doesn't want to tout all the things she does but yeah I, 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 I I think that, that the superintendent and others across the state have made it very clear that the cost of educating students, pre preparing them for college or a career, um, is not always the same. And that we probably have been underfunding that for a, a long time in the state of Nevada. And that's a conversation that we need to have going forward. So um, look, I, I, I'm proud to say that the state has taken that first step. I think you mentioned Senators Woodhouse and Dennis. I think we have to mention the governor as well as legislative leadership and the leadership at the state in terms of the Department of Education. But this step is going to make that possible. This is really groundbreaking. Uh, did we look at other models across the country or is this t completely unique? So um, I just came from New York and New York does have weighted funding. So we're one of the few states that hadn't had that in place and recognizing that all students are different. Um, what going forward is looking at the landscape for how we look at our students um, with special needs. The L's are English language learners, mm -hmm. free and reduced lunch, um, as well as our gifted and talented. So, you know, capitalizing on work that has been a, a done, completed across the United States, but also making sure that it is Nevada centric, that it meets the needs of our students in our context is, is very important. I want to capitalize on something that um, Jeremy was saying that I continue to hear, and, and when we watch social media, we see it quite often, is um, this is the first step in another goal that we have, making sure that the fo formula is right, because it didn't make sense to add additional funds into something that we want to change. So getting the formula right, getting that base right is, is critical, and then we are going to be looking at the adequacy components. And so we know that the dollars are flowing appropriately to our children. And I said earlier that Jeremy was at least one of the sort of architects of the plan, getting the dollars right was critically important. So Jeremy, how were you able to go through the steps in the process to arrive at what was the best funding formula? Look, I, I think, number one, it's a team effort across the board, right? Yes, I had the opportunity to help because I was asked to participate, but um, the legislators, the governor's office, the Department of Education, Legislative Council Bureau, and frankly, countless folks, including the chief financial officers and superintendents, were instrumental in getting us where we are uh, today. Um, you know, you sort of ask the question, how did we get it all done? We got it all done because there was the political will to get it done. And I also think that there was the belief that we can't go on to that next step until we completed this one first. And honestly, I think it's the will of folks like uh, Senator Woodhouse, who wasn't going to end her tenure as a senator in that legislature without um, getting this done. It must feel really gratifying to be part of something that is so monumental for the state, for education, and for our kids. How do you feel today after, after going through the session and going through these steps, and now here it is? I, you know, I was asked that question the other day. The, the legislative session is fast and furious and we're all doing our work. We're focused on making sure that we um, get our work done appropriately and we listen to all of our constituents. I was with some other state superintendents just yesterday and they asked me the same question. And I paused for a second and, I, and then I said, absolutely, this is the time for Nevada. We've made the decision on how to and have finally taken that first step that we've been talking about for decades. Um, so I'm extremely happy. I think the time right now for us um, to move forward is, is perfect. Uh, getting it right, working hard, you know, we still have a lot to do. Implementation is, is critical. We need to get that right, but we'll do the same iterative process um, that we've been doing to get to this point in time. Jeremy, you, how does it feel now? I don't know that I can add to that, to be perfectly honest with you. I think that's exactly right, right? Uh, happy to be where we are important first step there's a lot of work still to be done um, i think you have a whole lot of people that are committed um, to leaving this community better than they found it and really doing the right thing for the kids that are in our schools and um, yeah there's a lot of hard work we have a lot of hard work in front of us um, but i think this community and this state is up to it well, congratulations to both of you. Thank you for your service to the state and to education here in Nevada. On behalf of the Las Vegas Chamber of Commerce, we appreciate it. Oh, thank, thank you, you very much. All right, and thank you for being on the show. Oh, you bet. <laughs>
<laughs> All right, coming up next, you don't have to go a long way to get away. We'll take you to a best kept secret right here in our own backyard when we come back. I'm Mary Beth Seawald with the Las Vegas Metro Chamber of Commerce. As you can see, we are on the golf course at the Casablanca Resort and Casino. Lauren, tell us all about this golf course. Absolutely. This is one of the 11 world-class championship golf courses here in Mesquite. 18 holes of pristine green. You can also enjoy their $99 play and stay package. Perfect for your next getaway. Come practice your best golf swing like nobody's business. And if you're doing business like nobody's business and you want to be featured on our TV show, reach out to me at like nobody's business at lvchamber.com. Life's journey isn't just about what happens. At Nevada State Bank, we believe it's about who it happens with. The people who are there for I do and for welcome home. The people who are there for your growing business and the ones who are there for a lifetime. For every moment of life's journey, the people of Nevada State Bank are here for you because it matters who you spend life's moments with and it matters who you bank with. Nevada State Bank. This is the story of two businesses. Andy made a lemonade stand and hoped people would come. Jill did too, but she chose a team to get the word out about her lemonade stand. Jill learned early that advertising with the right team gets the best results. At Cox Media, we do this every day, helping your business grow to meet its potential. With our marketing expertise, Cox Media is your partner for advertising success. Don't let your business get left behind. Let's grow your business together. Contact Cox Media today. Smart City is based coast to coast. We currently have about 39 locations, from convention centers to arenas, stadiums, hotels, uh, public venues, we were just awarded the Entertainment and Sports Arena recently in Washington, D.C. We have a network operations center based out in our Las Vegas headquarters that are constantly monitoring all our centers 24-7. Thank you for watching this edition of Like Nobody's Business. I would like to give a very special thank you to our presenting sponsor, Nevada State Bank, our location sponsor, Mesquite Gaming, along with our guests, Steve Hill, President and CEO of the Las Vegas Convention and Visitors Authority, along with Joan Ebert, Nevada State Superintendent of Education, and Jeremy Aguero with Applied Analysis. Southern Nevada thrives when Southern Nevada employers thrive. From the Las Vegas Metro Chamber of Commerce, thanks for joining us.